Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and Navigating the Journey, which is usually airs on Wednesday at 11 a.m., today we are here at noon. And next week, we will also be here at noon. And then we go back to our regular time, which is at 11 a.m. So thank you for your continued support. Thank you for being with us. And as you know, Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end-of-life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture so we shift from not talking about dying but talk about it. It's time to share the way we want to live at the end of our lives. And it is time to communicate about the kind of care we want and don't want for ourselves. We believe that the place for this to begin is not in the intensive care unit. Together, we can explore the various paths to life's ending. Together, we can make these difficult conversations easier. Together, we can make sure that our own wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. So if you're ready, we ask you to navigate the journey. Today, we have just the most beautiful, beautiful <laughs> person that I know, Sister Joan Chatfield. She is a Marino nun, missionary. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. that correct? What? Marino? Marino sister, that's yes, right. Yes, that's uh -huh. correct. As well as the cultural, the chair of the cultural and such and such <laughs> committee <laughs> of the Interfaith <laughs> Alliance of Hawaii. Welcome, Sister Joan. Thank this you. is such Thank a pleasure. You. Her spirit just fills up the room wherever she goes. It's just yeah, I'll put wonderful. the scenery on the green. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wonderful to have you. Thank you. And uh, most people in Hawaii know you. They've met you everywhere at all kind of an events. Mm. Unlike anything or any other nun I have ever known. And <laughs> I was christened in the Catholic Church in 1938, June 1938, so it's been a lot of nuns and a lot of time. But you are just a beautiful, you such an inspiration if someone thought, you know, I could be a nun after meeting you. Most of the time, that's not what they come away with. <laughs> so tell me all about you, about your life as a nun. Well, mostly uh, Marino sisters are are committed to going beyond where they came from. So even though I'm a member of the New Jersey tribe, I came from, from uh, New Jersey, uh, I left home at 17 to go to Mary Knoll, and then Mary Knoll trained me, and I was on a track for medical school and accepted at Georgetown, and a sister in Kaneohe who was teaching high school science and got sick and Dr. Lip Kwan Pang had to do surgery and they needed a science teacher fast. So I came out here and I always say, um, I, I knew so little that you couldn't have even measured it. I mean, it was <laughs> below the scale of measurement. And, uh, but it was a one, I was in Kaneohe for three years, then Maui for eight years, then back to Honolulu. And during the 18 years of secondary education where I learned how to teach, I even got to be a very good teacher, not because of any education course I ever took, which I never took, but because of really appreciating what the, what the learning experience is. So in the early days, I taught always one class of religion and everything else science. So it was biology, chemistry, physics, general science, da 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 da, -da. But then after Vatican II, there were loads of people who didn't want to go teach religion, but everybody could teach science. So I let them do the science, and I went on and then got a degree, my first degree in religion in um, New Testament Early Christian Community Studies at University of San Francisco. Marvelous experience. And then I came back and worked um, at Marinole High School, finished my secondary education time. And then I went to Berkeley Graduate Theological Union and uh, University of California, Berkeley, to get a degree in sociology of religion. And I make the distinction that the psychologist is a specialist to ask questions of the individual, and the sociologist trains to ask questions of society. 
and then I specialized only in religion. So I, I pra I'm a practicing Catholic as a marital sister, but I'm also a sociologist broader than just my Catholicism. And it's helped me to take positions that say, look, my church doesn't want this, so I don't, wouldn't do this, but I need to tell you about the whole of society and probably got some visibility in, um, in writing an essay that, or having an essay uh, published just before the special session of uh, the vote on, on uh, gay marriage and gender equity. But the real issue was, so Catholics don't want it, that's okay, I can understand that, but let's go beyond. And I think this is an issue um, that has had the wrong name put on it too much. It's too, it, the focus is supposed to be on living and making decisions about life. And then it got co-opted by the word suicide and it has nothing to do with suicide, absolutely nothing. And so I really, when, I, when you asked if I would come talk about it, part of it is because I have a whole new theory and we'll get to that okay. after I, after you <laughs> let me get to my theory. I do have a theory. Well, of course, we will we'll get to that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, okay, I don't know where to go first. I want to talk to you, one of the things you said about the history of the church and about the religion, and we will get to the changes that have mm -hmm. happened in the church because I have seen, I'll be 79 next month, and I have seen all all kind yeah. of changes, and but, but it goes back 2,000 years oh, and the changes. Back longer than that, longer so. than that. I think that's the problem. People particularly see institutional religions as more connected with the cement and mortar that are their buildings, and it's not. So that's one thing. Second thing is that changes occur from the good expression of the leadership for the need for the change. They, they don't do it haphazard and they don't do it willy-nilly, but when they do it, and uh, the best example I, I have right now is the, the change that, and I didn't look up the year, but I think it was 1979, but I'm not dead certain, but uh, how about that, dead certain? This <laughs> is the change about uh, cremation. And it was done by all of the Japanese bishops. Every single Japanese bishop signed onto the request that Japan be allowed to cremate because as it was a social necessity, not just because they didn't have enough land, but because everybody else was doing it. And it was a distortion of what burial in the ground, to dust thou art, to dust. This is just getting the dust there faster. That's really what cremation is. But the upshot of it is that the people who did that request also did a good search in history and found documents in the second and third century that showed that there was cremation in certain places. And at that time, it had one part of it had to do again with space, but the other part had to do with disease. And I'm pretty sure after the bubonic plague, there was cremation. I would think so, you because know. they didn't have all of the tools we have yeah. now to but the other people. part is yeah. the other part is is the mystery of knowing that at the end of time you're going to be reconnected and decided I know as a child my first challenge was was uh, oh, who was uh, the guy who did the uh, flying tiger Chenault yeah and you know he when he died he wanted his ashes sprinkled from California across Hawaii across the Pacific to Japan and I'm thinking, how is God going to put him all together? <laughs> together you know? yeah. And my mother would very dutifully say, well, there's nothing that's a problem for God. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that was the answer for that. But no, I think, I think it's important to learn how, how history and religion fuse. And this will happen eventually. It's going to take a while, but it'll happen. Yeah, I, it'll happen. But those, there are so many of those changes that I have seen. Um, growing up in Baltimore as a young kid, and then we weren't supposed to eat meat on Friday. Well, when you grow up in a seafood city, seafood is wonderful every day, so who cares? Is What kind of sacrifice <laughs> is it? Yeah. Yeah. This is no so sacrifice yeah. not to eat meat. Come on. And then what I remember as real as small was that uh, meat was rationed during the yeah, war. During the war, right. So to get two slices of liver, we had to stand in line at the slaughterhouse. So fish was plentiful. 
so okay. who cares about me? Yeah. So well, it's, those kinds of things. That it's the whole connection with spirituality, and I think, I think we're more alert to the fact that that the spirituality is what should determine one's holiness, not uh, performance. Mm -hmm. when, so when we uh, about this, I have to tell you my one story. I've got thousands of them because spending that many years being a good Catholic. My husband was in the Air Force, and we were stationed at a place that God did not intend for people to live, and that's Alamogordo, New Mexico. Even the rattlesnakes moved. It, it was just not, not cut out. God didn't design it for people. <laughs> anyway, you know, the Air Force, Uncle Sam. So there we were. It's the middle of Vietnam. And so we had chaplains from every faith, but we didn't have a building. Yes. No, no, no church. Mm -hmm. No, none of the bricks and mortar. So we had. But the military know how to do that. Yeah. They they shift in, bring in the cross, bring in the candles. Yes. Yeah. So, we would have breakfast, mass every day at a different person's house, and the person that had the best breakfast always had the biggest crowd. For so, Father Bob and I got to be friends, and I had, I was created a picnic for all the children and I was so proud of it I'm in my early 30s and I'm so proud of what I had done to organize this thing and he looked at me and he says well what about rain which and I thought this is July this is the desert there's no rain it doesn't rain these are the thoughts and so I looked at him and I said well father Bob <laughs> With my relationship with the Lord, it's not going to rain. Well, needless to say, that ended my relationship with him mm. because we were supposed to go through the priest to get to God, right? We mm. didn't have a direct channel. So, so much for that relationship. Mm -hmm. So I learned after that one that <laughs> there's certain things we just don't do. However, let's get back to where we belong today to talk about medical aid in dying. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so many people said to me, "Will Sister Joan really talk about that?" <laughs> yeah, said, I'll really yes, talk she, about that. Yes, she will. <laughs> really, I'll talk about it. <laughs> yes, she will. So, yeah. how do we ri arrive at this position well, when the church has a different position? Okay, the first. Well, let's back up. Let's back up to the hospice movement. Okay. And uh, we had the wonderful founder of uh, St. Christopher's in London come here under Dr. Maria Broll when she was the medical uh, director for Eileen Anderson. So, you know, it goes. And then we had St. Francis Hospice. Right. We had Hospice Hawaii, Inc. That was it. We didn't have any more at that time. Now we have five more hospices that work well. And, and hospices per se are able to take care of a patient when they have the determination by the doctor that this is not going to get any better, they're not going to do anything more to intervene, and so basically they're made comfortable, and if you remember the original story was they had a thing called Dr. Brompton's Cocktail. Dr. Brompton was the doctor in London who figured this all out, and what he did was he kept people comfortable. And I think the medical profession has been doing that over time and probably long before hospice was invented. It's just that hospice gave it a dignity, hospice gave it a space, and so forth. Now, it was very interesting in the very beginning, hospice, St. Francis Hospice under Sister Maureen Kelleher was right on the top of the line. She, she really, she was the, the daughter of a policeman. I mean, she, she didn't miss any fun. You know, she, that was it. And she didn't particularly like the fact that Hospice Hawaii Inc. was formed. And so at the time, I was on the board of the um, Honolulu Theater for Youth. I come from a family where I had a mother who was on the stage in New York before, before I was born. So I love theater, and Honolulu Theater for Youth is a great invention in this town. Every single student can get to see one or more plays a year. And they had a play about a young man 
whose father had died when he was young and he was at an age where he needed a man and his mother hadn't remarried and the, the whole place singles around the, the young fellow going out and walking on the beach and meeting this man who tells him, you know, you got to be good, you got to do this, you got to do that. In the meantime, the mother, you, you learn that the mother has, has backed off into depression after the death of the father. So she's kind of hiding in her room, and she comes out to make the meals and that, and then she goes back in her room. And the boy had never been in her room. So the, the line, the, the critical line is that at the end of the play, the boy opens the door and sees that the man who has been talking with him, the picture is of his father. So it was a, you know, it was a very powerful thing. And it had to do with the whole concept of what happens in death and a young person dealing with it. So I decided that we would sell tickets that were green and yellow. And I never told anybody anything, but the green ones went to a bunch of people I know and the yellow ones went to, and the board members, we sell tickets and so forth. At the end of the last performance, we had made, we had profited about $16,000. So I got my friend in the bank to say, you know those big checks they have? I said, I need two of them. And we got two checks and we made a check for $8,000, $8,000, and we called up the director of hospice St. Francis and the director of hospice Hawaii Inc. Both up on the stage, they didn't know what was happening. They were each given a check for $8,000. I mean, you can't be getting money and then being nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the two great. go together. <laughs> that's great. And Sister Maureen, it didn't involve the sisters. It yeah. involved the people who were actually working in hospice. And, you know, a lot of that now, Interfaith Alliance, which I'm invited, uh, connected with, just, I think it was four years ago, we gave an award to every one of the hospice units. Again, to thank them for what they do in the society. My daughter is a... RN with hospice, island hospice. Yes, island hospice, mm -hmm. Wilson, I mean, caregivers, yeah. I mean, they're marvelous. So, so how do we go from, I, don't we need to take a break at this point? Aloha, this is Kelihi Akina with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network, Mondays at two o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us, we'll see you then, aloha. You want to talk about some socially sensitive issues relevant to women? Listen to these guys. Well, I think it's important in Judaism that we don't take the Bible literally. We take it seriously. Okay. I agree. And the, really the key to understanding Christianity is compassion. If you're compassionate towards other people, you are living a Christian life. And that relates also to dealing with women and men and women issues as well. Mm. Are women and men equal? They're equal. Who's Why better? Be Who's difference? better? <laughs> Depends tune on in, what. Tune in. My name is Calvin Griffin, host of Military in Hawaii, which airs here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 11 a.m. Please join us. We'll be talking about issues concerning our military, veterans community, and other related issues that concern all of us. Aloha. And we are having a wonderful discussion with Sister Joan. And <laughs> so we were going from hospice to yeah. where we are with medical aid in dying. Yeah. How do now, we get from there to How do we here? get from there here to there? Okay, one of the things is nobody goes into hospice or engages in hospice care unless they have made the decision that the end is coming. Now, sometimes it's going to be in a few days, a few weeks. Sometimes it's months. Right. But that's not the point. The point is that they no longer get medical intervention. They don't get any drugs other than palliative. Now, those are for people who have have a vocabulary that supports them to bring them to that point. It seems to me that we have a number of people who when you say, well, a lot of people say, well, I was born this and I'm not that anymore. And they have a, but they have a vocabulary from their youth or they have a vocabulary until they were hurt enough to leave. But there are people who have absolutely no religious vocabulary. They just have never been exposed to it. They call them the nuns, and it's N-O-N-E, -E, <laughs> not N-U-N-S. And I mean, somebody told me once, well, I'm a nun. I said, excuse me, yes. give me a break. But the real, the issue is 
that for those people, they don't have the, the kind of tradition, internal tradition, which if you were a Christian, Catholic or Protestant, evangelical, if you were a Jew, Reformed, Orthodox, or, or conservative, if you were a Buddhist, if you were a Hindu, if you were a Zoroastrian, you have that, that religious companionship, shall I say. You might not be real active, but you know that they're connected it's with there. you. All right, now, for the nuns, those nuns, N-O-N-E-S, they don't have that. So sometimes I think they're the ones that most need the legislation that would allow them to make this decision. And then this is what, I, I have a friend who, who is in Oregon, and they, of course have had the rule there longer than most of the states. And it, they have a, a study done that only three to 6% of the people who have the medication available to them use it. Mm -hmm. So that means that 97 to 95 people don't use it. Now what does that mean? What that means is, it's the security, like having something on my table, that if it really got to the point where I couldn't stand that I could do that. But only three to six percent actually do. And I think that that's a part of the argument that hasn't really been discussed. And it should be, that should be brought into the fact that that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about, for example, there's a Sacred Heart sister now, a real dear, 95 years old, and last year, and uh, just the week before Easter, she got this diagnosis of, of a terminal, uh, terminal illness, cancer um, in her spine and so forth. And it's going to be very painful. She says, you're so cute. She said to me, now I ask you, how could I be upset when this is the week before Easter and I know what Jesus went through on the way to the cross? See, she has the vocabulary, she right. has the tradition, and she also has the love of the people who support her. And she's in a supportive community. She doesn't need pills. She's being kept comfortable, you know? Mm -hmm. So I say, come on, let's, let's talk about the people who don't, don't. have that. And, and that's, to my mind, that's a matter of social justice. It's a matter of necessity. And I mind that the, I mind that sometimes the institutional churches, especially the big ones, and in Hawaii, the Catholics are the biggest and yes, they have the best vote. I mean, you know, if you have, and, and so I just always say, I am a practicing Catholic, don't get me wrong. Do not tell me I'm not a Catholic. I am a very good Catholic, thank you kindly. <laughs> yeah. But I am talking for the people who were not gifted. And look, any kind of religious tradition is a gift, for God's sakes. You, you don't come out of the womb and say, I will not be born unless I can be born in an institutional church. Of course not. It depends on your parents. It depends on your location. It depends on your family. And we need to have more understanding for the people who really are diminished in this area. If you stop and talk to somebody who has no religious tradition, I mean, for me, it's a, it's a picnic. I can talk for hours because there's <laughs> a lot to say. And then they say to me, you really mean, do you believe that? Yes, belief is a gift. It's not, it's not something that I earned. It's not something that, it's something I better use right. And I think that's the reason why I come on these programs and you know get into trouble. I do get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that, but that's worth it, you know, if you get the truth out. Well, well, that is my position, you know, obviously coming from that same tradition, that if you choose to be a Catholic or Protestant or whatever, that's your choice. And if you choose not to go down this route, again, that's your choice. That's what our program is about, respecting people's choices. Mm -hmm. So if you choose to have the cocktail, as you mentioned, then you should be allowed to make that choice. Yeah. And I should not stand in the way that's of right. you making that choice. Yeah. And that's and, what our program is about. And that's, that's really where um, the, more we can, the more we can help people understand this, I think it's, I think it's, um, it's a gift to the whole community, even to the ones that go down and get bust into to give the objection in the legislature. I mean, thank you kindly, that's not quite it. <laughs> well, that should be nice to people. <laughs> yes, but now they, they do bring up some issues that aren't in the bill. 
they talk about a slippery slope and they talk about old folks and the handicap. Which and that slippery not slope is the there now. It has nothing to do with the legislation. It does. It's there. Because if you want to do harm to somebody, we just saw that yesterday on the news where this kid did away with his mother. You know, if you want to do harm to somebody, you can do it. Our courts are full of people that did harm yeah, to somebody. And we should be more careful about how we give ethical training to people along the way. I mean, um, the Unitarian Church and the United Church of Christ have done a beautiful cooperative uh, program to teach people respect. And it, it could look like sex, sex education because that is a component of it. And often that's where the fractures come, where people don't understand their sexual behavior and their ethical behavior. Uh, thank you, Mr. Governor of Alabama. I didn't do anything wrong. Excuse me. You know, give me a break. Uh, this, this whole idea of how people understand what's right and wrong, and they can't. They don't learn it automatically. They have to be taught. Yes. You have to, and unfortunately, people are taught racism, and they're taught a lot of nasty stuff. They ought to be taught a lot of good, good stuff. stuff. Yes. Well, sister, will you come back and spend of more course. time with us? Whenever you and want. We could, we could just talk forever <laughs> for the rest of the well, day. Well, I don't know <laughs> a lot of people would like that. <laughs> I tell you, if nuns were like you, when I wanted to be a nun, I would be a nun. Oh, but what do your kids say? I mean, you have <laughs> children. I mean, that's not nice. No, I have, I have lots of children, lots of grandchildren, and now a great-grandchild, so... Well, so if I have a minute, let me tell you that the big vocation problem in the church is with the parents. Oh, I wanted you to be a, a, a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief. I wanted you to bring yes. us grandchildren. I wanted you to take care of me when I'm old. Give me a... I mean, that prevents <laughs> vocations more than anything else. So. I know. Yeah. Oh, yes. I That's know. another one of my pet peeves. Yes, please come back and spend some more time sure. with us. This okay. is absolutely wonderful. There's so much history about this church. <laughs> I love this church. And...